One last time for the verse of the month. We're going to recite these words together. Please join me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Nine different fruit of the Spirit. We've looked at, well, five of them. Love. On Holy Trinity Sunday, of course, love is really the sum of all of them. All of the other fruit ultimately fulfill that one, which is love. There is joy. And we talk about how joy is more than emotion. You know, there are good things that happen to me in my life that make me happy, and there are sometimes bad things that happen that make me sad. But joy transcends my circumstances. It is a conviction that we hold in faith that know that because Jesus lives, that I may too live a new life. So that even when bad things happen, even when I'm sad, that I can live in joy. There is, there is peace. Peace amidst my circumstances. Uh, peace that comes from trusting in God. Again, it's a state of being that we hold to. Patience. I talked about patience. And I have to tell you, of all the sermons that I've preached recently, I have heard more feedback from that sermon on patience than most every other sermon. Uh, it seems that it might have struck a nerve. And it might be a good one to come back to at some point in time. You know, the, the, the bad thing about being a preacher and having uh, younger kids at, at home is they hold you to it. I gave you a challenge that uh, if you're an you're, you're an impatient driver, that uh, you, you get in the fast lane and then you get all you know, the fast lane slows up and you're you're you're, you're you get all frustrated. Well, I had that happen the other day where I was in a certain lane, the traffic wasn't going, and I, I was getting impatient, and the boys held me to it. I said, Dad, don't you remember what you preached about? <laughs> you're supposed to get in the slow lane and start to pray for all of those people you're yelling at. <laughs> and then there's kindness that we talked about last week, God's loving kindness. Uh, he offers us mercy and he offers us compassion in the same way that we are to offer that loving kindness and compassion to others. Today we're talking about goodness and the bent on goodness, kindness and goodness. They, they, they're, they're similar to each other. But when it comes to goodness, I'm going to talk about an aspect of goodness as it relates to integrity, being people of integrity. And in your worship folder today, there's an outline if you want to follow along, if you want to take notes, I welcome you to do so. So integrity, what is integrity? Integrity is this, it is deciding to integrate the values of my heart. So it's making this commitment and I'm going to integrate the values of my heart, and not just as Christians, it's not just the values of my heart, but ultimately it is God's values. I'm going to integrate God's values into my daily actions, into everything that I do, everything that I say. In other words, I am going to be the same person when people are not watching as I am when everybody is watching. That is a person of integrity. Now the thing about integrity is that at some point in time, if you are a person of integrity, it is going to cost you. Sometimes being a person of integrity, there is a financial cost involved to it. Sometimes being a person of integrity, there is a social cost that is involved to it. Your, your reputation and the way that people look at you and talk about you. But Jesus says, or I should say the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 28, verse 6, better it is a, to be a poor man who walks with his integrity, even if it costs you everything. It is better to be a poor man with integrity than it is to be a rich man who is crooked in all of his ways. Another verse, First Chronicles 29 here, I know, my God, that you test the heart and you have pleasure in uprightness. God takes pleasure in our integrity. 
Because when we walk in integrity, when we are a people of integrity, we are representing him and ultimately pointing people to our God, the God that we serve. So why? I'm going to make a case for integrity. Why do we and should we value integrity? First of all, it goes without saying that it builds trust. We prove ourselves to be trustworthy through walking in integrity. Now, the thing is that it takes time to build trust. When you meet a person right away, you don't necessarily trust that person because you haven't had time with that person to build that relationship and to build that trust. Trust is something that is built over time and experience where we show ourselves to be trustworthy. But it was the servant, remember the parable of the talents, the first servant who showed himself to be trustworthy. He took the five talents that he was given and he produced five more. He showed himself to be trustworthy. And then he heard these words, well done, good and faithful servant. And because he was trustworthy with the little that he had been given, which was actually a whole lot, he was then given more. However, keep in mind that while it takes time and experience to build trust, it only takes a second. One poor decision, one careless word to destroy that trust. So it's important that we always consistently walk in integrity. A second value of integrity is that it offers it offers protection. You think about building a house. Jesus says the one who built his house on the shifting sand. The wind came, the storm came, and what happened? The house fell over. But the one who built his house on the solid rock, when the wind came, when the storm came, that house continued to stand. If we build our lives on on truth. We build our house as a house of cards. If you build your house on lies, eventually those lies will be found out. Those lies will be discovered. You can only cover it up so long and the house will fall. Integrity gives us protection to know that we are walking in the truth and that we don't have to defend a lie. A third value is that it gives security. And this is similar to protection, but when I'm talking about security here, the idea is that it gives us peace of mind. You can sleep with yourself at night. You can live with yourself. Because there is something that when we don't walk in, 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 in integrity, it plays with our conscience. Of course, there are people who have their conscience seared and they can justify their actions. But if we are a people of faith, if we are a people of integrity, we can walk securely and sleep well at night, knowing that our house is built on the solid foundation, not worrying about being discovered, not worrying about being found out and carrying that anxiety in our hearts. I wonder... I wonder these days when there is such a rise of people experiencing anxiety and anxiety disorders, how often, how much are they carrying anxiety in their hearts because they are living a double life? That they are trying to present one person over here, but actually living their life as a different person. Fourth value of integrity is that it gives it gives guidance. That you know what to do. There are times in life where we have difficult decisions to make. But when we walk in integrity and we know the truth, it will guide our decision. It says in the Bible, the third commandment, honor the Sabbath day by keeping it, it holy. I know I want to honor God. I want to walk in integrity and to obey the commandments, to obey the, the third commandment. 
So on a Sunday morning, when there's lots of choices of different things to do, you know what my choice is going to be. I'm going to choose to be here in God's house with God's people because I desire to walk in integrity. And I don't have to think about that decision on Sunday morning because I want to honor God and to follow him. That's the thing about habits. When you have a habit, so many people are overloaded mentally. They have so many different decisions to make. But what happens is you develop a habit, and when something becomes a habit, you no longer have to think about it because that's just what I do. I, do. I designed my life in this way, and it lo- offloads something else that I have to decide and make a decision in my mind. But here, when we walk in integrity, it is God's word that guides us. And we don't have to think about what the right thing is to do because we know the right thing to do and we've designed our lives around the right thing to do. Some marks of integrity. So what does it look like to be a person of integrity? Well, first of all, you speak honestly. You speak honestly. Now, you might think to yourself, the Eighth Commandment is, you shall not lie. And we think to ourselves, well, I tell the truth most all of the time. I can't think of a time where I have lied. And for the most part, a lot of us, we don't outright lie. But we do, if you will, fudge the truth, which is a lie. There's different types of untruth. One type of untruth is exaggeration. We tend to embellish the facts. We make more of ourselves than what we are. You watched the debate this last week. Our two candidates started arguing about golf. And that's one place that people tend to exaggerate about their golf game and put themselves out to be a better golfer than they really are. Or fishing is, is another place where, yeah, we go right there. Uh, fishing is another place where we tend to exaggerate. But I, I know that there, there's pastors. We go to pastors' conferences, and, and pastors like to compare themselves with other pastors. And whatever career you might be in, you may compare yourself with with others. And we get together and we tend to maybe exaggerate and fudge a little bit and make things out to be better than they actually are. Uh, Another way we do that is through minimization. Maybe we're confronted on a certain thing that we said or we did, and we tend to minimize and dismiss the consequences of our, our actions. Then there is omission. Right? Where we will, where we will, we'll, we'll set forth, you know, we'll talk about ourselves, but then we'll conveniently omit certain things that might make us be perceived more negatively. So we omit certain facts. We omit certain things. There is also then fabrication. And fabrication is just, it's simply making up a story. It's simply making up things. Maybe we tell a story about ourselves that is not true so that others will think more about us or will think better of us. Then there is flattery. You know what flattery is? Flattery is the opposite of gossip. Gossip is when you will say behind someone's back, what you will not say to their face. Flattery is what you will say to their face without saying behind their back. In other words, that you will compliment someone insincerely in order to get your way with them, to manipulate them, to get them to do what you want them to do. Sometimes I'll have my kids come up to me and they'll say, oh, dear dad, most wonderful dad. Uh, Because they're, and i like, what do you want? (laughs) There is sarcasm. 
and sometimes we'll make sarcastic comments. Be very, very careful of using sarcasm because it's saying something with our words that isn't necessarily true, but trusting that our body language will convey the actual truth to show us that we are speaking truthful. But it's very important that if you do use sarcasm and, and use sarcasm very sparingly, do not use sarcasm in written communication because we show sarcasm and, and we, we, we use body language when it comes to speaking sarcasm. But if you're posting sarcasm on social media, if you're writing an email and using sarcasm, I can guarantee you that more often than not, it is going to be misunderstood than it will be understood. Uh, another way where we don't necessarily speak honestly is plagiarism. And plagiarism is when we take someone else's work, we take so what someone else said, and we play it off as our own. And one important place today in our world, we have this new thing, this new person called I. Right? You know I? AI? You've seen the rise of AI. It's something that's very, you know, it's not very new, but it's, it's coming to prominence in our culture. And there is a temptation for a lot of people to take AI, what is written by AI and said by AI, and then to present it as if it is their own. It's a brave new world. But as Christians, again, we're called to speak honestly and to be people of integrity. Second thing, confess regularly. Confess regularly. And what I mean by this is that we are not perfect people. This is where we admit our faults. Sometimes we're called out on something and we'll try to make every single excuse we can come up with. If you need an excuse, any excuse will do. But the best thing to do, rather than making excuse or trying to cover yourself up, is just simply to admit, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? But what happens is we are discovered to be in the wrong and we try to cover that up with a lie. And then that lie is discovered and we cover that up with another lie, and then another lie. Lies are covered up with lies. And the circle in which we will be exposed continues to grow and continues to expand because with every lie that we tell, we're just that much closer to being exposed as a person of unintegrity every time we tell a lie. Third thing. Live consistently. And this is being the same person in private that I am in public. That I act the same when everyone is looking as I do when no one is looking. Because sometimes we behave one way for a certain group of people and then over here, we'll behave another way for a different group of people. Or when, again, when no one else is looking. But Jesus calls us to be people of consistency. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So when you say something, mean it. If you commit yourself, we, and we are an overcommitted people, we are involved in a hundred different things, but rarely committed to any one thing because we overschedule ourselves. We overcommit ourselves. And so oftentimes what we find ourselves doing is we say yes, but then because of our schedule, then because of our workload, we are unable to follow through what we promised that we will do. And encourage you, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Why do we say yes 
to promise and make promises we can't keep. Oftentimes, it is out of, of pride. Oftentimes, it, we don't want, we are people pleasers, and we don't want to let that person down, but ultimately, we do let that person down because we don't follow through with our actions. So be careful of your commitments. Because every time you say yes to one thing, you are saying no to a thousand other things. So be very careful what you say yes to, to make sure that you are saying yes to the right things, saying yes to the things that are true. The fourth thing, commit openly. Commit openly. This is to speak up and to stand up for when God needs you to speak up and to stand up. I can't tell you how many times as a Lutheran I have sung the song, stand up, stand up for Jesus while sitting down. And we hold that our faith in our hearts. But God doesn't call us to simply hold our faith in our hearts, but to share our faith. That he fills our cup with joy, with peace, with patience, to overflowing in the lives of others. Being a person of integrity is being willing to stand up and to share what you believe. But we live in a culture that is increasingly hostile towards Christianity and the things of God. And it's very easy for us as Christians in the midst of that hostility, in the midst of, of fear, of retaliation, what people might think and what people might say and what people might do that we hide. We hide in our church. We hide in our sanctuary. We hide in our homes. We hide on the internet. And, and we fail to stand up for that which we believe. Him whom we represent. Jesus calls us not to be ashamed. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of salvation for all who believe. And I might be ridiculed. I might be persecuted. But I can hold in confidence that as I live as a person of integrity, even though it may cost me my money, my reputation, and even my life, at the end of the day, I will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters. I'll leave you with this. We follow Christ. John chapter 14. Jesus says, I am the way. He walked in integrity. He says, I am the truth. In a confusing world, a lot of times we don't know what to believe. And it's important for us as Christians, true, that when we pass on information, because there's so much false information out there. And that's another way in which we lie is when we don't confirm what we hear and we pass it on as truth when it is not truth. Just because it didn't originate with you doesn't mean that you're not responsible for the truth. But Jesus says, I am the truth. And he is true to all his promises. He never fails us. His word is true. His word gives us hope. His word gives us conviction. His word sets the path for us. And he says, I am the life. He's come to give us abundant life. Life that is maybe not filled with money. Maybe that is not filled, life that's not filled with fame necessarily. But he promises to give us a life that is filled with all the fruit of the spirit of love, of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Amen.